largely be focused on prophecy, so let's begin at the beginning. I know a lot of you people have a fair amount of background, some don't, but we're filming, so I'll have to say certain things for the sake of the recording and the internet that you may already know, but hopefully not too much. We're going to look tonight at time frames of prophecy, time frames of prophecy, looking at prophecy from God's perspective. One of the problems people have with apocalyptic literature and with things like the book of Revelation is, they approach it from a human perspective or from man's perspective of time and space instead of looking at it from God's perspective. But most prophecy is written from God's perspective. Time frames are very important. The scriptures can be speaking of more than one time frame in the same passage, particularly when it deals with prophecy. More than that, it can have a double reference. It can be referring to two different times at the same time. As you, you, some of you know, that's called a Pesher interpretation. A Pesher interpretation. For instance, Hosea 11.1, 1, most of you know this, out of Egypt I called my son. Well, it's talking about the exodus of Israel and the Jews, but Matthew applies it to Jesus coming out of Egypt, fleeing a wicked king as Israel did. The same prophecy could have more than one meaning the first meaning is a type or shadow of the second one that's called a pesher. When you read the book of Revelation, some things are sequential. Seven seals, the seven vials, seven trumpets, <coughs> seven peals of thunder, seven churches. They are largely sequential. But then you get things like the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. <laughs> you, you go back, you go forward, past, present, and future, all become, from a human perspective, convoluted. But from the perspective of God, it's not convoluted. It makes perfect sense. Now, my apologies to those who know this. I've said it before, but for the recording and for people who may be with us the first time, I've got to go through the motions. We have two Greek words for time, chronos and kairos, chronos and kairos. Chronos is chronology an order of events, Kairos is one of these, okay? Kairos always depends on planetary motion, always depends on planetary motion. Even though we have atomic clocks that work by particle emission, they still have to be calibrated in nanoseconds by planetary motion. There's no other way to measure time other than by planetary motion, okay? That's Kairos, but Kronos, is an order of events. The scripture speaks of a believer giving up the ghost, going to be with the Lord, not as death, of course, but as going to sleep for two reasons. One, when you go to sleep, you wake up again, the resurrection. Death is for unsaved people. Believers don't die, they go to sleep in the Lord, but not soul sleep, they're in his presence consciously. But when they do that, their consciousness enters a different sphere of perception, a different sphere of reality. You've entered eternity, okay? Now, sleep. When you sleep, you can see people who have died alive again. You can see future events as yet to transpire taking place in the here and now. You can see past events being recapitulated. Past, present, and future are all the same. Neurophysiology tells us when we sleep, we always dream. We always dream. So you dream, and in a dream, there's chronos. There's an order of events. Then I dream this, then I dream that, then I... but there's no time. The dream takes place outside of time. There is no kairos, no kairos. There are certain times in Scripture where God intervenes with time, with kairos. Certain times he intervenes with time, with kairos one of which is in Joshua. Give me when he stopped the sun, made the day 48 hours, okay? In the book of Revelation, a day is going to go from 24 hours to 16. 
third of the sun, third of the darkness, it's going to disappear. A day is going to go to 16 hours. God's going to intervene with time. Another point where God intervened with time was, of course, the fulfillment of the prophecy of Amos chapter 8. I will make the sun go down at noon. And we see that fulfilled in the Gospel of St. Luke. It became dark when Jesus died. Because it was Passover, the 14th of Nisan, we know it couldn't be an eclipse, either solar or lunar. God had to intervene with time, as it were. Now, when the king died, the sun goes down, then it comes back up again. That's how you can work out three days and three nights. It's the easiest way. Separate subject, I only mentioned it in passing. One other time, God intervenes with time. When the longevity of King Hezekiah was increased, remember? The sun went back. Well, everything has to balance out. The average life expectancy in biblical times was 50 to 55. That's all. The average life expectancy was 50 to 55. Hezekiah was in his 30s. He got an additional 15 years of life. Jesus was executed at the same age. The death of one king of the Jews balanced out the longevity given to another king of the Jews. You understand there's a relationship. One king of the Jews had his life lengthened because another one died. Um, it equals. God intervenes with time. Time depends on the second heaven. The Greeks have the concept of the earth. Our time, our atmosphere is the first heaven, the atmosphere of the earth, clouds and so forth. The second is outer space, and the third is eternity. Paul says he was taken up to the third heaven when he was somehow raptured in 2 Corinthians. Okay. Well, when you see in, in Zechariah and Revelation, the heavens, the Shemaim in Hebrew, were rolled up like a scroll. Outer space disappears, and eternity meets time and space as we know it. It depends on planetary motion. Now, again, my apologies to those who've heard me say these things. I'm basically saying it for the sake of the recording. You've got to get the framework right of how prophecy works. What is for his first coming? What's for his second coming? And what is for both? What's for the first coming? What's for the second coming? And what's for both? Don't try calculus until you can do some algebra. Don't try algebra until you can do arithmetic. Yes? But once you get the basics, it becomes easier to think in those terms, mathematically, and it becomes easy to think in those terms theologically. Get the basics right. Additionally, unfortunately, the Gentile church was Hellenized at the time of the church fathers. And they would see prophecy as a prediction and a fulfillment. A prediction and a fulfillment. While the authors of the scripture had a Hebraic perspective of prophecy, where there were multiple fulfillments, Pesha interpretations, each one pointing to the final, ultimate one. Take anything. Take the abomination of desolation. It already happened with, with Antiochus Epiphanes at Hanukkah time, as Daniel predicted. Jesus celebrated Hanukkah in John 10. He took an event that already happened and said it's going to happen again. Josephus shows us when the temple was destroyed, as Jesus and Daniel predicted, the Romans set up pagan ensigns with the temple mounted, on the temple mount where the te temple had been and began worshiping other gods. The early Christians thought that that was an abomination. Okay. Uh, then you have the Emperor Hadrian. He built a temple to Jupiter, the Roman equivalent of Zeus, because it was the biggest planet, called Arolina Capitolina, and they began worshiping Jupiter this false god on the Temple Mount. Now Zeus, the Greek Zeus, is a corruption of Theos, God, okay, on the Temple Mount, another abomination. Constantine's nephew, Julian the Apostate, tried to repaganize the Roman Empire. And he tried to rebuild the temple with a deliberate intent of reversing what Jesus said, not one stone will be thrown down upon another. Well, it didn't work. All these mysterious fires happened and the whole thing was turned to rubble again. It didn't happen. If you go there now, to the Dome of the Rock, you'll see on the Temple Mount, God has no son, inscribed from Sorah in the Koran on the Dome of the Rock, over two very demonic-looking images, naturally occurring on slabs of marble. I'm convinced it's the Antichrist and false prophet 
I'm, I'm, I mean, I wouldn't make a doctrine of it, but it's too much of a coincidence to be a coincidence. <laughs> it's not a coincidence. Uh, again, 1 John tells us that which denies the Father's Son is Antichrist. There's an abomination there now. Multiple abominations. The same as Antiochus set up the image in the temple. There's multiple. But each one of those abominations is a picture of the final ultimate one, the Shikusa Meshomem, the abomination of desolations that the Antichrist will set up. Prophecy is pattern. It is not simply prediction and fulfillment all the time. Well, how do you put this together? How do we understand the frameworks of prophecy? It seems to be very confusing. Remember, God declares the end from the beginning. He always declares the end from the beginning. We have to see prophecy from God's perspective, not just from man's. It's important to understand history. You can't understand prophecy without understanding history. It's important to understand many things, but it begins with getting the divine perspective. One passage of scripture that is a good primer, in my view, to show ordinary Christians how this works without getting overly sophisticated, is just to do a verse-by-verse -verse examination of Isaiah chapter 11. Turn with me, please, to Isaiah chapter 11. Ishayahu Hanavi. Then a root will come from the stem of Jesse. This speaks of what is in Hebrew the Shortish Ishai, the root of Jesse, and it connects with the book of Ruth, the book of Ruth. Okay? Now, the stem, a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. In Jeremiah 28, and I'm sorry, 23, and here in Isaiah chapter 11, you have the answer to a problem in the New Testament. When Jesus is born, and because of Herod's son, his parents take him to Nazareth instead of back to Bethlehem, he shall be called the Nazarene, as it was written. Well, there's no such verse anywhere in the Hebrew scriptures in the Old Testament he shall be called the Nazarene. The verse is not in there. Why is the New Testament quoting something as if it's in there when there's no such verse? Hebrew uses wordplay. Hebrew uses wordplay. They had certain scribal devices or scribal techniques. One was the equivalent of highlighting. One was the equivalent of emboldening. And one was the equivalent of underlining. There were no chapters. There were no chapters. They were written as books. But you'll see the, in the Kitab tradition, the scribe, called the Sofer. <coughs> Scribes were so, Sofrim, from the Hebrew Lispor. They literally counted the numerical value of every letter, alphanumerically, to make sure that they didn't miss anything or make any mistakes. They used mathematics to make sure that they stayed faithful to what the text said. They knew that the book, hypothetically, of Job had to be 14,276,491. <coughs> if it came to 492 or something, they, they knew it was wrong. But they didn't do it by the whole book. They did it by each verse. They knew that each verse had to have a certain numerical value. These were the Sofrim. They were academic experts on the text who used mathematical means. Now, this later became corrupted by something called Kabbalah in the Middle Ages, but in mystical Judaism, they introduced numerology into it, but there was nothing wrong with what the scribes did. That's just how they basically did it. They used something called gematria, gematria, the numerical value of the letters to make sure something was right. Now, this is a bit complicated. I don't want to go into it too much, but in Matthew, you see the 14 generations. Well. 14 in Hebrew is the number of David's name, Jesus, the son of David. Dalit, okay, four. Vav, six, Dalit, four. David, 14. Well, that's the gematria of David. They, they use mathematics to enhance and present the theme. It had to add up mathematically. Now, the genealogies are a separate subject, 
But that's an example of Gematria. He shall be called the Nazarene. Where are you going to get? Well, there's no verse that says that. Nazar, Nazar, Netzer. There is a word, Netzer, branch. In Hebrew, you use a bolded first letter of a word, of a verse, okay, to show it's the cardinal verse that the context depends on. Okay, that was one technique. Another technique was the size of the letters. They put big letters and then smaller ones and then big letters. That was sort of like italicizing. I'm just drawing a broad equivalent. The third technique, however, was where you use wordplay, where one word sounds like another word. That catches your attention. So for instance, in the book of Amos, he sees, what do you see? He says, I see an almond tree, chickens. I'm looking over my word to perform it. In Hebrew, for the end has come for my people. In Hebrew, the word summer is kayets, kayets. But the Hebrew word for termination is kets, kets. Amos uses one word that sounds like another to draw people's attention to the text. In English, we use wordplay in order to make a joke, usually, or as an advertising gimmick. In Biblical Hebrew, it was there to draw people's attention to something very important. What do you see? A basket of summer fruit. Okay? Tzel priyakayetz. Kayetz. The end has come for my people. The ketz has come. You use one word that sounds like another to draw people's attention to something very important. Okay. Well, it's the same thing. There's no, he shall be called a Nazarene. Nezer. No tzri. But there is, he shall be called a Netzer. One letter difference. One letter difference in Hebrew. And the letter is a tzaddik, which is also, we get the Hebrew word for righteous. The Messiah would be a righteous branch. One letter difference. Use one word that sounds like another, but even the one letter difference has a meaning. Tzaddik, a righteous person. Uh, charity, tzedakah, okay? To be correct, tzedek, all from that one letter. A righteous Jew, a righteous person is called a tzaddik. It's the name of the letter as well. Now, this is just a little bit complicated. You'll have to uh, listen to our other material. We explain it in greater depth much more slowly, and I write it down and so forth. But this is the way that it works, OK? This is the way that it works. So there's no verse, he shall be called a Nazarene, but there is a verse, he shall be called a righteous branch. It refers to another passage where you use wordplay, the way that we would use underlying, sort of. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. In the Hebrew canon, it is usually six, but in the Septuagint, it's seven. It's seven. In the New Testament, like the Dead Sea Scrolls follows, the New Testament, sorry, follows the Septuagint and the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls, which predate the Masoretic text, the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Septuagint agree 80% of the time. And the New Testament, when it quotes from the Old, follows the Septuagint and the Dead Sea Scrolls closer than it does the Masoretic. Okay? Slight difference. So it's a sevenfold spirit. The seven spirits of God in Revelation. No, sevenfold spirits. Okay. Seven aspects of the same spirit. This relates to the divine throne with the rainbow. You have the seven basic colors of the atmospheric spectrum, okay, from ultraviolet to infrared. It's seven. That's why you see your rainbow on back of the divine throne. It corresponds to the Holy Spirit. Now, in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is called the pledge or the earnest, we translate it. When God destroyed the earth in the days of Noah with water, he put a rainbow 
as a pledge that it's not going to happen again this way. It will not be destroyed again this way. The Holy Spirit is always the pledge or the earnest of the Lord. It's the rainbow. It's the sevenfold spirits. Not seven spirits, but sevenfold. Uh, Benny Hinn came up with a crazy idea once that there were multiple Holy Spirits and people believed them. It's one spirit with multiple aspects, like one rainbow with multiple colors. Okay. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision by what his ears hear. Okay. Verses 1, 2, and 3 are prophecies about the first coming of Christ. You see that? It's about the first coming. Verses 1, 2, and 3 are about the first coming. Verse 4, but with righteousness. Now again, you've got to play on the word branch and righteousness because of the letter tzaddik. With righteousness, he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. That was not his purpose in his first coming. That is his purpose in his second coming. So from verses 3 to 4, you have a shift in prophetic time frame. Do you see that? Yeah. All in the same passage. Remember, there's no chapters in the original canon. But all in the same passage, it shifts from speaking about the first coming to the second. Okay. He didn't do those things in his first coming. He did not strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, but Revelation says he's going to when he comes back. So now we shift from the first coming to the second coming. Verse 5, also righteousness will be the belt about his loins, and faithfulness the belt about his waist. That is first coming and second coming. This is eternal nature. Verse 6, the wolf will dwell with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little boy will lead them. And the cow and the bear will graze. Their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. You have animals, zoologically now, that are inimical to each other. They are predatory and prey. Okay. A time is going to come when carnivorous animals are going to become herbivorous. And there will be a natural peaceable harmony in the biosphere, even among the animals. Remember in Romans 1, the creation, it, I'm sorry, Romans 8, the creation itself groans out. Yeah. When man fell, the creation fell with him. Once we get to that verse, verse 6, it shifts to a prophecy about the millennium. It shifts to a prophecy about the millennium. If you don't know, the original plan that God had for the human race cannot be thwarted either by the devices of Satan or the sin of man. Amen. He had a certain plan for the biosphere, he had a certain plan for the human race, and those things still have to happen. The millennium will be sort of what would have happened had Adam and Eve not sinned. The original plan God had must still be fulfilled. Amen. This is the messianic kingdom. Okay, There'll be a complete harmony in the biosphere. Now, we can say more about this in just a moment, but let's look a bit further. Verse 8, the nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra, 
and the weaned child will put his hand in a viper's den. Okay. Remember, it was the serpent, the Nahash. Always the dragon and the serpent. Dragon is the persecutor, serpent is the seducer. Children will be, it'll happen zoologically, but children will be immune from spiritual seduction. The snake will not have the power to seduce. Satan will be bound. He'll not be able to seduce spiritually. Paul says in Corinthians, I fear that you'll be seduced like Eve was. That will not be the case of the millennium. We have three things, the world, the flesh, and the devil. In the millennial reign of Christ, there'll be no world. There'll only be the earth. There'll be no, sat no tempter. Satan will be bound. Okay? And there'll be two kinds of people in the millennial reign. The first kinds of people in the millennial reign will be resurrected and or raptured believers. Their bodies will be the same bodies, but they will be the kind of body Jesus had in his resurrection. Okay? They'll have supernatural powers and so forth, and they will co-reign with Christ. The descendants of the survivors of the last seven years of the day of the Lord, they will enter the millennium and begin to produce offspring. Their bodies will be like the bodies we have now, minus, minus illness and reduced longevity. They said if, if somebody does at the age of 120, it'll be considered a pediatric fatality. They're going to have the longevity of antediluvian man before the flood, like, like Methuselah, Methuselah, when he goes, death shall come. Yeah, it's going to be like that. They're going to live incredibly long ages. Now, some people ask the question, well, why then does Ezekiel write of the millennium with all these sacrifices and so forth if the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin? You've got a baby, a, a, a baby a few months old, just learning how to crawl. That baby has no sense of right and wrong. You've got to take anything that that kid can get his hands on and put it where he can't or she can't reach it because they're going to put it in their mouth or something. They have no sense of what's right and wrong, good or bad. A baby does not know. They're completely innocent of everything, yet they have a fallen nature. Okay. They only know what they want, what they want, but if you take it away from them because it's dangerous for them, they cry and kick up a fuss. Well, that shows the fallen nature, but although they have the fallen nature, they're not accountable for it. I tell people who have the responsibility of a Down syndrome child, wherever God gives a burden like this, he also gives a blessing. That child will never have accountability for their sin. You know they're going to go to heaven. You know they're going to go to heaven. Suffer so the little children unto me, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The Lord does not take their sin into account. Do they have sin? Yes. Does God take it into account? Jesus atones for it. You understand? He atoned for it. Well, people in the millennium will be like that. They will not have the same understanding of sin that we have. Now, the people who are in glorified bodies, this doesn't concern them. We're only talking about the people born during that time. In the Old Testament, the blood rituals of the Levitical sacrificial system were types, pictures, shadows, to teach what the Messiah would do. The Paschal Lamb, the Am Kippur scapegoat, and so forth. These animals were pictures of what the Messiah would do, okay? They were shadows of the Messiah. In the millennium, they're going to be there to teach people about what the Messiah did do. They're not going to have the same concept of sin that we have. When you have these animals that are a, a lion as a pet and things like this, and they don't understand how the brutality of killing an innocent lamb, people... This is how ugly sin is. This is what will happen. Because at the end of the millennium, those people will have to face the same test we have. Satan will be released. Now, God allows that to happen for a couple of reasons. The first reason he allows it to happen is he wants children who choose him. He doesn't want robots who don't. 
That is true of angels, and it was true of men. He allows it. Secondly, because Satan is the accuser. He accuses us, but he also accuses God. We see this in, in Job. We, I'm sorry, we see this in Job. We see it in Zechariah. We see it in Genesis. Uh, he accuses man to God. He accuses God to man. Some people ask, why doesn't God just destroy the devil? He will after he proves him to be an absolute liar. <laughs> so there'll never be any question as to God's integrity. You know, <laughs> then he'll do it. But in the meantime, he uses him for his purposes. Okay. The blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. Those people won't know about sin in the same sense that we do. Okay, they won't know about sin in the same sense that we do. The Levitical sacrificial system you see in Ezekiel will be preparing them for what's going to happen at the end of the thousand years. It will not affect believers now who are resurrected or raptured or whatever the case may be. The other aspect of the millennium that's important is this. Yes, it's what would have happened if Adam and Eve didn't sin, but it's what would have happened had Israel accepted her Messiah. God had an eternal purpose for Israel and the Jews. That's why we will have a Judaic priesthood during the millennium, okay? That's why you're going to have a Judaic priesthood in Israel during the millennium. The original purpose that God had for Israel and the Jews still must happen. The original purpose God had for the human race still must happen. Amen. Now, there are things that teach about it that teach about the millennium. What it was like when Adam was with the animals before he fell, well, that's a brief glimpse. Another insight, unveiling as to what the millennium will be like is the reign of David and Solomon. When there was peace all around, when David ruled with a rod of iron, and then there was peace with the Gentiles, King Hiram and Solomon together, they built the temple of the Lord. There was this perfect peace between Israel and her Gentile neighbors worshiping the same God. That is another picture of what the millennial kingdom is going to be like. Again, these only highlight certain aspects of it, but they do give us a vague or dim picture as to what it's going to be like. The early Christians were uniformly premillennial, uniformly premillennial. We know that even from the patristic writings of the church fathers. Do not believe a millennial and post-millennial nonsense. It's an invention of Hellenistic Christianity that has no basis in, 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 in Scripture. After Constantine pseudo-Christianized the Roman Empire, they had to begin spiritualizing it away. You ask somebody who's, who's, who's not premillennial, do you believe that there's seven years at the end of the world when there's going to be a tribulation and there's going to be the, the day of the Lord? Oh, yeah, we believe the seven years. And do you believe that it's cut in a half, two times, time and a half time? Oh, we believe that, yeah. Well, you, you take those time periods literally. Oh, yes. Well, then why don't you take the thousand years literally? <laughs> They're inconsistent in their hermeneutic. Remember, Jesus only fulfilled the suffering servant prophecies in his first coming. He has not fulfilled the conquering king, the Davidic prophecies, till the second coming. He must fulfill both to be the Messiah. Amen. If there's no millennium, he's not the Messiah of the Jews. And if he's not the Messiah of the Jews, he's not the Christ of the church. Do not believe a millennial or post-millennial nonsense. It's all rubbish. Amen. The early Christians did not believe such nonsense. Now, unfortunately, there have been some very good believers, even some very good preachers and Bible expositors in other areas. But when it came comes to the subject of the millennium and eschatology, they're not very good. Their mind is colored by the th wrong thinking of the Hellenistic church. We have to go back and understand the scriptures the way the pre-Nicene church did, especially the way that the first century church did. Now, there's more that can be said about this, but understand now, Isaiah shifts to talking about the millennium. Okay. Verse 9, they will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. 
the Antichrist will want to set up the abomination of desolations on the holy mountain. Okay? Nebuchadnezzar wanted to destroy the first temple. Titus destroyed the second temple. Ultimately, the Antichrist wants that mountain, and he wants to be worshipped on the sides of the north. Okay? In the millennium, Jesus will rule from the throne of David. It's not going to happen then. It will be invulnerable. It will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. To this day, it's the largest man-made plateau in the world. It's the most contested piece of real estate in the world. These things you see happening even as we speak. There are two yeshivas in Jerusalem. Two yeshivas. They have been for over 22 years, going on 23 years, looking for mitochondrial DNA signatures in Jews with names like Levy, Levinson, Levinsky, Siegel, Cohen, trying to resurrect an Aaronic priesthood. They began doing sacrifices. They did one in a synagogue in the Jewish quarter, Rovah Yehudi, in a neighborhood called Misgav Nadak, last year. This year, they did it next to the Temple Mount itself. It was known as the Davidson Center. And ironically, the Sanhedrin has been reformulated, in addition to the Rabbinuts. And one of the members of the Sanhedrin, the spokesman, Rabbi Berg, he said they want to invite the Arabs the, to help reinstitute worship on the Temple Mount. Of course, the Arabs don't see it that way, but it shows you they're being set up for the Antichrist, aren't they? They're being set up for the Antichrist. Exactly what's happening. But in the millennium, Jesus will reign. J Jesus will reign. So let's look again, going back to verse 1. Verse 1, first coming. Verse 2, first coming. Verse 3, first coming. Verse 4, second coming. Verse 5, first, second coming, doesn't matter. It's eternal nature. Verse 6, verse 7, verse 8, verse 9, millennium. Verse 10, then in that day, the nations will resort to the root of Jesse, the shortish Ishai who will stand as a signal for the peoples, and his resting place will be glorious. That will ultimately be fulfilled in the millennial reign of Christ. Isaiah 19, among other passages, speak of it. We'll look at that shortly. But this passage is a big problem for unbelieving Jews. The most important rabbi in the history of Talmudic Judaism, which is a false Judaism, is somebody called, they just call him Rambam, Maimonides. Moses Maimonides was his name. And he wrote a huge book called Guide for the Perplexed, Guide for the Perplexed. And in this book he admits there's a problem with this prophecy, that the reason is Christianity is because it made the Gentiles worship the Jewish God. And he even says something similar about Islam. But they've got a problem with this. The Jewish Messiah would make the Gentiles believe in the Jewish God. It's amazing. You go to Argentina, a country with a history of anti-Semitism, but they've got a huge cathedral where they pray to a Jewish Jesus. You go to France, a history with a country with a history of anti-Semitism. They've got Notre Dame Cathedral. They pray, pray to a Jewish Jesus. We don't like you, Jew. We don't want you, Jew. We hate you, Jew. You're a Jew. We don't want you in our land. We don't even want you in your own land. You're a Jew. We despise you, Jew, but we worship your God. We believe in your Jesus. We read your scriptures. <laughs> it's not even logical. But it's the truth. The nations will resort to the root of Jesse. Now, this speaks of his pre-existence. He comes from the house of David, but he pre-existed before it. That's why it says in Micah 5, 2, the one who comes, O you Bethlehem, not least among the clans of Judah, from you will go forth one whose existence is from eternity. 
the one who comes from the house of David existed before the house of David existed. From the root of Jesse. Again, this relates to the book of, of Ruth. But let's continue. Verse 11. Then it will happen on that day. The Lord will again recover the second time with his hand the remnant of his people who will come from Assyria, it's like Iraq, Egypt, Pathros, Hush, Elam, Shinar, Hamat, and from the islands of the sea. Now this pretty well addresses the extent of the known world at that time. The Hebrew word for a black African is a Kushi, or translated into English, a Kushite. It's the same word for Ethiopia. They knew about what is today Somalia, Eritrea, the Horn of Africa, Djibouti, Ethiopia, they, and southern Sudan, and upper Egypt, the black people. That's Kush to them, okay? They didn't know about the Congo, or about Zimbabwe. They didn't know, you know, about Botswana but they knew about the Horn of Africa and Northern Sudan and the adjacent area. Well, Jews are going to be regathered from Ethiopia? Well, yeah, the Falashas were. <laughs> they came from all these countries, from Mesopotamia, from Iraq, from Iran, from Iran. They came from all these countries. But notice something. Israel is only regathered twice. The first time Israel was regathered was after the Babylonian captivity, as predicted by Jeremiah and by Isaiah and written of by Daniel and later Ezra. The prophecies of Jeremiah and Isaiah were recorded as being fulfilled by Daniel and uh, by Ezra, okay? That was the first regathering, 70 years in the Babylonian captivity when Darius the Mede and Cyrus sent them back. Okay. That happened. No question, everybody knows they were regathered one time. This is the second time. Now I know some of you were from the background of the Worldwide Church of God, British Israelism, uh, that said that the Anglo-Saxon and Anglo-Celtic nations were the lost tribes. This is complete nonsense. When you read Ezra, and Second Chronicles, you see how it's nonsense. First of all, the tribes were never lost. They were never lost. They were taken into the Assyrian captivity. A small number stayed and intermarried with the invaders. They became the Samaritans. Okay. The others were taken into the Assyrian Empire that was quickly, very quickly afterward, conquered by Babylon. And we read in uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, when they came back, the people from the northern tribes came with them, okay? People from the northern tribes. It wasn't just Judah and Benjamin. It was some people from the northern tribes who came with them. Additionally, although Israel backslid before Judah, the northern tribes backslid before the southern tribes. The Assyrian captivity was in 721. The Babylonian captivity was not until 585. During the revivals of kings like Asa, the faithful people in the north came south to Judah. People leave bad churches for good ones, okay, as, of, as it were. Okay. They never disappeared. If you read the Gospels in Luke, Anna was from the tribe of Asher. Okay. When James writes his epistle, he writes to the 12 tribes. We even know from the Mishnah, the Jews knew their tribal identities into the second century A.D., C.E. They knew their... This whole idea is completely, completely crazy. And of course, in Ezra and Nehemiah, with the first regathering, people from the Assyrian captivity came back with them. They were never lost. Never lost. Now, we can go into this some other time, perhaps, but with mitochondrial DNA, if these 12 tribes were also 12 regions, provinces, or counties, sort of, okay? If you got enough hard tissue, enough hard bone tissue, to 
to get enough DNA signatures down to the tribal level. And they've begun doing it with, they've got like 250-something people that they say are, are descendants of the Levites. If you can do that with the other tribes, it would not be unthinkable to take Revelation 7 and Revelation 14 literally. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be. I'm not saying it's going to happen that way, but scientific reality is very much changing the perspective that people have always had. It may be possible. Let's look. Recombinant DNA, I'm sorry, uh, mitochondrial DNA research is getting better all the time. You can send in your saliva and they'll tell you what country your forefathers came from. But if they can narrow it down even further to which clan, now you need a lot of DNA from a lot of ancient bone tissue to get it, but such technologies are always on the horizon, it seems. They're getting better all the time at it. Well, let's look. So we see, verse 10, the nations will resort to the root of Jesse. The Lord will regather the people the second time in verse 11. Only two times has Israel been regathered as a nation. One, after the Babylonian captivity, and two is now. It had to happen. It had to happen a second time, and it has happened a second time. Jesus made it indisputably clear Jerusalem would be trampled down by the feet of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. Plethadon ethnon, you've heard me point this out, Luke 21, 24. Matthew 23, 39. The Jews must be in Jerusalem for him to return. To say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Baruch Abba B'Shem Adonai. Zechariah chapter 12, Jesus speaking in the first person through Zechariah by the Holy Spirit. They will look upon me who they have pierced and mourn as one mourns for an only son. The burden of the Lord concerning Jerusalem. Jesus, three times, speaking directly in the first person, made it clear the Jews would have to be back, not just in the land, but in Jerusalem as their capital. It is the only way major passages of the Old Testament can make sense, is to take Jesus' words literally, yeah. and to take Zachar uh, Isaiah 11 literally. It also simplifies other passages in the book of Revelation, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and so forth, the simplest interpretation is to take what Jesus said literally. Let no one tell you that contemporary events in the Middle East do not fulfill prophecy. Now, remember, Zechariah says it's about Jerusalem. That's going to be the issue. Yeah. Not the Golan Heights, not even the West Bank, not Gaza. It's going to be Jerusalem. That one square mile of the Temple Mount that is going to be the epicenter of conflict. That's where the Antichrist was going to set up the Shikutsa Meshumem. That's what the struggle is literally going to be about. Now we have other teachings dealing with this, but note the Jews must be regathered to Israel a second time. It only happens twice. Only happens twice, and it's happened exactly twice. And all the nations that they knew of those days, it added up. He will lift up a standard for the nations, verse 12, and assemble the banished ones of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. That is setting the stage for the second coming. Second coming. Then the jealousy of Ephraim will depart. Ephraim represents the ten northern tribes. Okay. And those who harass Judah will be cut off. Ephraim will not be jealous of Judah, and Judah will not harass Ephraim. When you read the Old Testament history, we see something. In the Old Testament history, we see there is always contention between Ephraim and Judah, between the north and the south even incipiently in the days of King Saul, but it goes well beyond that. It goes well beyond that. The conflicts between the north and the south, they even had military confrontation. 
When the Jews are regathered the second time, it'll not be like that. It'll be one nation. It won't matter if you live in Haifa or if you live in Jerusalem. It won't matter if you live in Tel Aviv or if you live in Tiberias. It'll be a monolith. It'll be one nation. It will not be a divided nation when it is regathered. In the days of Jesus, it was divided. You have the jurisdiction of Pilate, and before him, Herod the Great, and in the north, it was a separate jurisdiction of the, Philip the Tetrarch and things like this. There were different rulers, different prov provincial governments under the Romans. There'll be none of that. It'll be one nation. So what's happened? Well, let's look further. They will swoop down on the slopes of the Philistines, in verse 14, on the west. Together they will plunder the sons of the east. They will possess Edom and Moab, and the sons of Ammon will be subject to them. Swooping down on the slopes of the Philistines on the west, this speaks of a military conflict in the Gaza Strip. The Gaza Strip is to the west. That will be one source of conflict. When you see people talk about a two-state solution, they're speaking absolute nonsense. According to the League of Nations, the predecessor of the United Nations and the San Remo Agreements, okay, the uh, agreements that was made after World War I when the map of the Middle East was redrawn, uh, but, but there's something called the Sykes-Picard Agreement, that Jordan was seen as Palestine. There was always a two-state solution. There was always a two-state solution. In 1970, King Hussein of Jordan said that Jordan is Palestine. In 1968, Yasser Arafat said Jordan, Palestine is Jordan. They said that themselves. Before the present House of Saud came to power, King Musharraf of Saudi Arabia said that Israel was for the Jews. Before the Ba'ath Party, Saddam Hussein's party, deposed the monarchy in Iraq, King Faisal of Iraq said Israel was for the Jews. In the time of Allenby, the mayor of Jerusalem said that Israel was for the Jews. They always knew it. They always accepted it. A Palestinian was a Jordanian. A Jordanian was a Palestinian. Today, 30% of the population of Jordan are Bedouins. Same tribe as Mohammed. 70% are Palestinian Arabs. They already have a two-state solution. There has always been a two-state solution. If an Arab Muslim on the West Bank, Judea or Samaria or East Jerusalem, said, I'm a Palestinian, I'm not a Jordanian, before 1967, <laughs> guess what would have happened to him? It is a Palestinian state with a Hashemite Bedouin monarchy. These countries were largely created by the British and the French. You understand? Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, they were created by the British and the French with, with the defeat of the Ottoman Empire. After the Turks were defeated, they created these countries. They're all there artificially, except for Israel. <laughs> except for Israel. They're the indigenous people. Okay. The archaeology proves they're the indigenous people. Well, be that as it may, they talk about a two-state solution. Well, they've got a two-state solution. Now they want a three-state solution because Hamas rules Gaza <laughs> and the Palestinian Authority rules the West Bank. So now you got to, and they hate each other, so now you've got a three-state solution. But then they don't want a three-state solution. They want a right of return of the grandchildren and great-grandchildren of Arabs who left. In 1948, the Israelis told the Arabs to stay. The United Arab Command told them to leave. So we pushed the Jews into the sea. Now their grandchildren and great-grandchildren demand the right to come back, not to a new Palestinian state on the West Bank or in Gaza, but they want to come back to Israel proper. So they want a one-state solution, and that state will be Palestine, where they'll undoubtedly 
if they ever got it, kill each other. But of course, they won't get it. But this is what's happening. There's a battle over the land because there's a battle over Jerusalem where Satan got his biggest defeat, where he will get his final defeat, and it's over that Temple Mount. The whole thing with Iran, the whole thing with... The, Satan will do anything he can. Anything he can to dispossess the Jews from being there in order to prevent the return of Christ. Because he knows when Christ comes back, what the prophecy says, they'll look upon him who they have pierced. It's Satan trying to do this. Now the Antichrist, of course, will broker a false peace in the Middle East. This relates to Revelation chapter 11. But it's not our purpose today to go into that in any depth. Just be aware of it. There's going to be a conflict with Gaza, but somehow Israel is going to be forced to invade Jordan. Southern Jordan is Edom, where the mountains are red from the word Adom in Hebrew. If you've been there, you see the mountains from like uh, uh, Masada. You can see the mountains themselves are red, and it's where Esau lived. Remember Esau had a reddish complexion? Yeah. So he went to the land of Edom, central Moab. Central Moab is central, Moab is central Jordan. Again, a child of Lot, appropriated by the daughter with the daughters. Okay. A nation and a people that came from incestuous relationship. Okay. And the sons of Ammon, Ammon is northern Jordan. We get the capital today, Ammon, where the Ammonites were. Same thing. They'll be subject to them. Somehow Jordan will come under the strategic control of Israel. Now again, it's a related but separate subject. Daniel tells us that it will be certain areas of Jordan alone that will not come under the full dominion of the Antichrist. Certain areas of Jordan alone will not come under the full dominion of the Antichrist. This fuels the belief that many Christians have had that there'll be an escape to Petra or Basra. Uh, I've been there various times. It's an incredible place. This is where they filmed one of the Indiana Jones movies. But it's actually, it looks like Colorado with the Pueblo Indians, where they carved the buildings and the facades of the rocks. Same kind of thing as that. Different area of the world, different civilization, but the same thing, carving the buildings and the facades and the escarpments of the rocks. And it's there, it still exists. So it is, it's interesting that these areas of the world, uh, of, 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 of the world that are spoken of, are in play and in central focus again in world events. If the Hashemite kingdom falls, you're going to have a big problem in Jordan. Israel will be forced to make a move. Okay. The Lord will utterly destroy the tongue of the Sea of Egypt. This is probably around, this is the Gulf of Aqaba, probably, around Eilat and the Jordanian port of Aqaba. And he will wave his hand over the river, and with scorching wind, he will make it into seven streams and make men walk over the dry shod. Now, some people relate this to Genesis, to the creation. They say that's where the Garden of Eden was. I won't go there now. And there will be a highway from Assyria, the remnant of his people who will be left, just as there was for Israel in the day that they came up from the land of Egypt. In conclusion, look with me very briefly to Isaiah 19. Verse 21, the Lord will make himself known to Egypt, and the Egyptians will know the Lord in that day. They will even worship with sacrifice and offerings and make a vow to the Lord and perform it. The Lord will strike Egypt, striking but healing, so they will return to the Lord, and he will respond to them and heal them. And that day there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. Now again, in the days of Nahum and these prophets, these were the two regional powers that were in continual conflict with each other. That's what the book of Nahum is about. Okay, Israel was caught in the middle of, of the struggles between Assyria, the Nineveh, Ninevites, and the Egyptians. 
and the Assyrians will come into Egypt, and the Egyptians into Assyria, and the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. And that day Israel will be the third party with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth. Whom the Lord of hosts has blessed, saying, Blessed is Egypt, my people, Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. In the millennial reign of Christ, Egypt will be called his people, Ami. Assyria, the work of his hands, and Israel, my inheritance. Anthropologically, modern Egyptians are not the ancient ones. They're Arabs, they're the descendants of Arab invaders. The original Egyptians are in Upper Egypt, that is Southern Egypt, the Nubians, black people, and the Copts, the Coptic Christians, it's about 9% of the population. But they are anthropologically descendant from the ancient Egyptians, and some of the Copts are believers, some of them. The Assyrians, the same. They're Christianized. They have a form of Catholicism, but some of them are evangelicals. I've spoken at Assyrian Pentecostal churches. It's interesting that the descendants of the ancient Assyrians, the real descendants, not Arabs, who, who came with the Islamic invasions from Arabia, but the indigenous Assyrians are Christianized, and the indigenous Egyptians are Christianized. Okay? They're the real Egyptians. They're the real Assyrians. People ignore these things, but it is historical and anthropological reality. So, in conclusion, verse 1, first coming. Verse 2, first coming. Verse 3, first coming. Verse 4, second coming. Verse 5, eternal. Verse 6, millennial. Verse 7, millennial. Verse 8, millennial. Verse 9, millennial. Verse 10, second coming. Verse 11, partly first coming, but mainly second. Verse 11, uh, setting the stage for the second coming. Verse 12, second coming. Verse 13, second coming. Verse 14, second coming. Verse 15, second coming. Verse 16, millennial. But it puts it all together. You've got to break it down piece by piece. The shifting time frames of prophecy. From a human perspective, it seems mixed up and convoluted. But when you understand that God sees the end from the beginning, it is not. We have to alter our ways of thinking about scripture and prophecy to go back to the understanding of the early church. Okay? Does everybody understand? Yeah. That's the introduction to some of the things we'll be looking at this weekend, Lord willing.